start with a question. None of the speakers uh, compared notes or anything like that. What are the odds you'd hear two talks about sweat lodges at a <laughs> architect's conference in New York City? Just ponder that. Uh, we're going to talk some science, but it really gets at, I think, the mystery of life. So I'm just waiting for my slides. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about, about what the last speaker was saying about when he described that idea of starting and just going with it is really what we might call a Bayesian walk, the fact that you can often learn things more completely by doing a sort of evolutionary algorithm where you don't try to invent the whole thing all at once. I, I need 20 seconds on the timer. I'd be happy to take 20 minutes. I, there we go. OK, so we're, you know, I, I study mind-body uh, mind stuff. And the task today is to ask, you know, how can we best optimize the mind-body balance in the digital age? And this is what most people in my part of the world are doing. Uh, and it should look familiar. It's essentially a maker bot for the human being, in a way, right? That, you know, we know the world's not perfect. We know we have a lot of challenges. And one of the ways to fix that or to try to address that is to change who we are. And humans being the way humans are, I suspect that this will be primarily the way of the future. And what it really boils down to is trying to find ways to take the complex algorithmic thing that we seem to be uh, and convert it into a digital, a digital entity. And you can see this both in attempts to join human beings to robotic structures. And you can see it in things like gene therapy. Because genetic code is basically a binary structure surrounded by all sorts of, of, of more complex phenomenon. These ideas that we're going to be able to boil ourselves down and change us I think is 100 years from now will have had a huge impact on who we are. But our interest has actually been uh, to do something a little bit more modest, which is to try to optimize what we are already, to try to better understand the evolved beings that we are and ask, are there things that we can do that are tractable in the modern world without uh, resorting to the Stone Age to enhance our performance now, given what we are? Uh, and of course, these two approaches are not mutually exclusive, but they do have different flavors and different tendencies. The one on top is more reductionistic. Uh, the approach that we're interested in is a little bit more ecological, a little bit more holistic, uh, perhaps a little bit more systems-based in some ways. So if we're interested in capitalizing on our evolutionary legacy, uh, I want to suggest to you that there's good things that we can more, that we, that we could do better at, at optimizing, bringing into our lives. And there are some bad things. And good here are things that tend to make human beings happy. Bad things are things that tend to make us unhappy. There's some bad things that we, sh we might think about trying to attenuate. And I want to give you examples from our work of attempts to do both those things. Now, when we talk about what we are as beings, as beings that have come across a long stretch of evolutionary time, many of the key elements of who we are go back to the very beginning of life on Earth. Uh, four and a half billion years ago, we separated from the rodents about 60 million years ago. And yet we use rodents very reliably to identify new antidepressants. Because you can give a rodent an antidepressant and put it in a certain type of test. And if the rodent responds a certain type of way, because the antidepressant does the same physiologic things in the rodent that it does in us, there's a pretty good chance that it'll be an antidepressant in human beings. So when we think about this question, we are really talking about a legacy that goes way beyond the human. Having said that, today, since I only have 16 minutes and 42 seconds, I'm going to focus on more recent human evolutionary traits that we know from many, many studies are beneficial for human health and well-being uh, to the degree that we can bring them into our lives. So we know that strong interpersonal and group belonging uh, is probably the single most powerful promoter of satisfaction, life satisfaction and well-being. You can see it in every country in the world. We know that there are certain patterns of eating and certain patterns of exercise that tend to benefit people more than others. And alas, the modern world has, in general, a pattern of eating and exercise that is absolutely 100% suboptimal. Uh, addictive, it taps into some very, very ancient, evolved preferences, but it, it basically parasitizes those preferences and produces most of the health problems that we see around us uh, now. 
And then there's a lot of evidence that we evolved to have certain types of connection with built space, natural space, and, and something I'm not going to talk about today, but I'm fascinated with, and that we work on to some degree, relationships with microorganisms have been powerfully, powerfully changed in the last 100 years. And there's increasing evidence that we once existed in a back and forth conversation that uh, provided some real emotional and uh, physical health benefits. What I do want to do today is give you an example of how certain ancient wellness or healing practices that have been with human beings for thousands of years may also have real powerful benefits for uh, happiness and well-being. Uh, and the one I want to talk to you about remarkably <laughs> is a sweat lodge. Go figure, you know. Um, you know, something like sweat lodges have been reinvented repeatedly by human beings uh, for thousands of years. You see them in almost every culture. And when they're introduced, they tend to spread through cultures. This is not an ancient phenomenon. There are modern iterations of this. Uh, those guys should probably run more and sweat less, but anyway, there they are. <laughs> and uh, there are these people, including one of my main collaborators, who have this bizarre habit of doing yoga in like five trillion degree rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, and there must be something to this. Well, my buddy that does the yoga, the hot yoga, is a, a, an animal scientist, and he is showing that in fact, if you take a little rodent, remember I said that rodents are good model subjects for antidepressants. If you take a rodent and cook it, I don't mean cook it and eat it, I mean warm it up <laughs> substantially, <laughs> and then put it in a test, it works exactly as if you'd given the rodent Prozac. In rodents, heat is a powerful antidepressant. So of course we couldn't leave this alone. We had to get our own high-tech uh, sweat lodge. This is my colleague Clemens, and we've been cooking depressed people. And by cooking, I mean we stick them in this hyperthermia box so cool. and heat them up pretty righteously for about two and a half hours. The, the air temperature is about 130, 140 degrees. Body temperature gets up to 102. Hottest I've ever been in my life. I was panting and dying. and It's very intense. Uh, you don't need anesthetic. It's not that intense. But you'd never stay that long in a sauna. Uh, and this is called mild whole body hyperthermia, interestingly. And We've shown uh, in a, not a large group of subjects, but in about 20 people or so, that if you take folks that are really depressed, and that little dot is how depressed these people were the day before we cooked them one time, and that dot is, if you've got a score of 30 on this scale, you're not, you've gone into an inpatient hospital, which is where these people were. You're, you're, you're pretty much done for. One session. And then we measured their depression score five days later, and it had dropped in half. Now, it didn't take five days to drop in half. When it works, it works immediately. People come out of the box, and they feel, on average, 50% less depressed. What's remarkable is that one session lasts for at least five days. And in some of these folks, we followed them out for another six weeks. They started getting therapies and vitamins and things like that. They didn't really get antidepressants. Uh, but, but they actually did better. Their scores dropped even more. So here's an example of an ancient practice that people go to and they see the aurora borealis and they hear the drums. There's something about the heat itself that seems to have a very powerful effect on well-being. Well, we think we know what it is, and I'm not going to torture you with uh, every little dot and circle here, but from the same guy that does the animal studies, my buddy Chris Lowry, we know that if you heat the skin, it doesn't just randomly go all over the brain. In fact, there's a specific pathway that runs right up to these nuclei in the, in the deep part of the brain. And those guys, those nuclei, tend to have two effects. In animals, at least, they make them act as if they're undepressed, and they cool them off. So it's a pathway that runs from the skin to the brain, back to the skin, and it's partly a mood elevator, and it's partly an air conditioner. If that's true, you would predict that uh, if you really stimulated this pathway, not only would you make people less depressed, you might make them less hot. And what's interesting about this is that we've known for 30 years that people with major depression run a chronic fever. As a group, their body temperature is about 2 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than people that aren't depressed. And if you treat them, on average, their body temperature drops when they get over their depression. And one of the interesting effects of this skin-to-brain circuit is if it is not functioning very well, it raises body temperature. So we think that some depressed people actually are depressed in part because this circuit, which has a lot to do with cooling you off, doesn't work very well. 
Uh, and there's this interesting corollary that we have some evidence that some people that are depressed may be depressed because their skin isn't functioning very well. It may not be their brain, it may be their skin. So does this box cool people off? So we actually measured people's body temperature for 24 hours, core body temperature, little pill that they stick up their backside. Uh, and this is what their body temperature is the day before they go into the box. And lo and behold, they get this really large drop in body temperature at exactly the same time that they get this drop in depression. And moreover, just as you'd predict, if this actual sort of skin-to-brain pathway was messed up in depression, the hotter people were, when you heated them up, the more of an antidepressant effect they got. It's as if you sort of reset the dial on this system. And interestingly, it, what this says is the more their temperature fell, the more their depression fell. Very consistent with this idea that we don't tend to think about feeling blue as having anything to do with your temperature, but it does have something to do with it, and it really points to the fact that this is an example of an ancient practice that clearly has some sort, is tapped into some sort of evolved mechanism that produces well-being. Now, we think the other thing it does, of course, is activate the brain much more specifically than something like an antidepressant. So, of course, this idea of activating the brain specifically is a great target for the sort of high-tech, digital, uh, approach, and this is another way of doing that. So this costs 100,000 bucks, requires neurosurgery, but now people with depression are actually having a probe put in their brain, and it is stimulating a part of the brain that we know from animal studies is stimulated by heat. So this is one way of doing it. It's cool, it's got a lot of really neat gizmos, it costs a lot of money, a lot of money is made. But we think that you can actually access these ancient evolved sensory pathways to do the same thing, because they also wire to the brain very specifically. And what I would suggest to you is that this is an example of using something that we already have in our evolved repertoire to do something more cheaply, uh, more pleasantly than some of these other high-tech alternatives. So there's an example of trying to recapture something positive from our past that, that we've sort of lost hold of. Let me talk a little bit in the time I've got less left about maybe attenuating something negative. So I first came upon this idea from the writings of an anthropologist years ago named Evans Pritchard, who observed that in Africa, during certain seasons of the year when times were tough, the tribes would all get together and they'd form this large collective and they'd pretty much get along. And then when things got easier, they'd start fighting with each other and break up. And it was the same thing every year. First they'd break up into clans, then they'd break up into families, then husbands and wives would be screaming at each other. And he called this segmentalism this bizarre tendency of human beings to break into small group and to form opposing camps and then get very, very upset about it. I sometimes call it this, the, the tribal mind, and there's a lot of evidence that we have a physiology, both in our brains and our body, that evolved to cope and to promote this tribal mind. And the problem, it's always been a problem, it's, res, it's resulted in a lot of mayhem through all of human history. Uh, we know this because people like Jared Diamond, who spent years studying the remainder of of, of hunter-gatherer societies say that, you know, small-scale societies are always divided into three groups, friends, enemies, and strangers, which remarkably is exactly the same categorization that the Buddhists give, something they call the three poisons of desire, aversion, and ignorance. They call them the kleshas, and they recognize them as the source of most of the world's problems. And increasingly, scientific evidence is supporting this. I mean, I don't need to tell you that this tendency of human beings to sort of wall off and go at each other on all levels produces a lot of stress, a lot of loss, a lot of misery, may blow us to kingdom come before we're done. But that tendency and the psychosocial stress that it engenders also actually plays a fairly significant role in most of the disorders of the modern world. Heart disease, obesity, cancer, dementia, things like post-traumatic stress disorder, and the thing that I mostly study, uh, depression. Because it turns out that all these disorders share in common a, a tendency for the individual that's afflicted with it to run what I sometimes call danger pathways, which are things like inflammatory systems and the autonomic nervous system too hot. Always on alert, needlessly on alert most of the time in the modern world, but day in, day out, accumulating this, this wear and tear that depending on your other vulnerabilities ends up as depression early in life or dementia later in life. 
So this tendency, this tribal mind test te uh, tendency, causes trouble from the macro to the micro. And so if we wanted to try to attenuate something from our evolved legacy, this would be a good thing to do. And about 12, 15 years ago now, uh, me and, and actually not, not the Dalai Lama directly, but my, my colleague, Geshe Lobsang Tenzinegi, uh, to, my, to the left, uh, decided to tap into a whole corpus of ancient Tibetan practices called Lojong, which to my knowledge are the most rigorous, thought out, exacting ways to change people's perspective in such a way as to vitiate this tribal mind tendency. So we decided to, to secularize it, boil it down into something that could be taught in eight weeks usually, and see if we could teach it to people and change how their brain and body function in ways that would turn down these danger pathways, make people more empathetic, make them feel more connected and less threatened. And I don't have time to show you all the data. I just wanted to show you two studies to give you a taste of this. This is what we call it. We call it cognitively based compassion training, or CBCT. Starts with, with learning how to concentrate, learning how to be mindful, which it shares with other meditation practices. But then walks through a lot of, of sort of, of self-visualization and cognitive restructuring moves to try to break down this instant tendency to categorize everything as a friend, an enemy, a stranger. Something good, something bad, something of no concern. And so, for instance, we know uh, that a human evolved tendency is the ability to recognize facial expressions and that most of this ability resides in our ability to read the eyes. That old saying is really true. They are the window of the soul. And uh, Paul Ekman, years ago, and others have shown that, that when, when, when Paul Ekman took pictures like this to tribes people in New Guinea who had never seen a white man except for him, showed them the pictures and asked him, you know, what are those people feeling? And the, the, the tribes people did really pretty well. Darwin was right about that. There are these sort of evolved emotions. We are much better, however, at recognizing the emotions of people that share our racial and ethnic identity than we are strangers. So this is what we did to test the effect of this CBCT, this cognitively based compassion training. Imagine you're, that you are lying in a scanner, all right? So we're gonna take a picture of your brain while you do this. And I show you this picture. Is that a man or a woman? Okay. What's the expression? Pay playful, comforting, irritated, or bored? Playful. Playful. Playful? Okay, so that's why you guys are all artists and designers and, and uh, sort of tapped into human things, right on both counts. I give this lecture, I give this portion of it fairly often, and most of the time, about half the room doesn't get it, so you guys are ahead of the curve. All right, so imagine we do that in a brain scanner before and after you either get eight weeks of this compassion training or eight weeks of a health discussion class, which serves as a comparison. So it turns out that compassion training makes people significantly better at that task, and it does so by lighting up producing more activity in these brain areas. Now what's interesting about these brain areas is that these are all the brain areas that we know are required to recognize the expression on other people's faces, to identify with other people, to feel empathy for other people. And, and individuals who have uh, uh, psychopathy, so criminals, people with autism, people that are very depressed have underactivity of these exact same brain areas. So here's some evidence that we can tap into one ancient skill, which is our ability to sort of empathize with others, typically in the context of others being within our own little circle, and extend it outward so that we can, we can heighten something we already have in our toolbox, which is this ability to recognize and resonate with the expressions of others and, and put it to good use. Now, Clearly the child is the father of the man or the woman, and so what we'd really like to do is try to, to bump people in this regard earlier in life. So we've been doing a whole series of experiments, sometimes in inner city foster kid populations where all the kids have been abused or traumatized, sometimes, as in this case, in a very progressive private school in Atlanta. We've been teaching this cognitively based compassion training with some alterations to fourth and fifth graders, to little bitty kids. Uh, in a classroom setting, and we haven't published this yet, but we've had this really interesting finding. We took one classroom, taught them this, this specific cognitively-based compassion training, took another classroom, and really focused them on mindfulness. And mindfulness here means 
the ability just to concentrate and pay attention, sort of typical meditation. And then we look to see whether these practices made the kids more likely to have more friends, to identify a larger group of people as being in their in-group, to having more of a sense of connection with the people in their class. And we found that both, what this shows, blue is before the teachings, green is after. Both regular meditation and this CBCT made the kids more able and more willing to find friendships and expand their social circle and be less sort of in-group, out-group. But there was a much stronger effect with this CBCT, suggesting that we can specifically train young people to have this more pro-social, uh, altruistic type of mind. So again, I think the point here is not that, that we should be against digitalizing who we're becoming. I, I think there's no escape from that. But that we should recognize that we have a rich evolutionary legacy that we can tap in to optimize who we are while we're on the way uh, for that journey. And so with that, I will thank you.